The theme of Brother Norton's class this week is the life of Daniel, and today's class is entitled Outliving Babylon. Brother Matt. Okay, how are we all, brothers and sisters? Nice to see you all again. Um, well, our topic for this week is Daniel, and uh, it's such an interesting subject. So we want to start off, first of all, it's probably uh, in keeping with Sam's subject. I want to ask you the question, first of all, what is an enemy? And you know how I like to interact, don't you? And if you get an answer wrong, I'm not going to say, oh, what a stupid answer that is. <laughs> I, I do sometimes say that, but I won't today, I promise. What is an enemy? Or what does an enemy do to you? Or do, uh, uh, you know, how does an, act, an enemy act towards you? Right, they try to hurt you. They oppose you. They take your stuff, right? They can steal. Yep, what else? They harass you. What do they say about you? Mean things. Are they true things? No, they make things up. They lie. And uh, what would the ultimate enemy do? Destroy you, try and kill you. Exactly. Exactly that. And so, what's the greatest enemy in the Bible? Right, so we know it's sin and death. Everyone understands that, sin and death. Because that's an abstraction, we go, oh, okay, yeah, okay, what's it look like? And like Sam's pointing out, you know, it's this sin and that sin, and it's not righteousness, it's unrighteousness. But what the Bible does, in an effort to show you what sin is, and uh, to help us understand it, the Bible's just full of pictures, full of images, full of metaphors and personification of sin. So if we got sin, the great enemy, and we said, let's give it a territory. Let's give it a land where it lives. Let's make it, let's, ha let's, let's have some people there. We'll give it rulers and priests and a temple and a whole system. All that will oppose God, hate God, persecute his people, blaspheme and lie about him. What would be a good title for that metaphor to teach us about what sin is? What was that one? Yes. First go. It's Babylon. Babylon is an excellent metaphor to teach us all about sin. And we'll talk about Babylon in the New Testament a little bit. But Babylon is a liar and a murderer. I don't know if you've ever followed this through, but it's, an, it's a classic theme. Who was the first liar and a murderer? Before him. Serpent was. Because Cain was a chip off the old block, he was just like his father, because John tells us that. Cain's just like his dad, the devil. A liar and a murderer. A liar and a murderer. So a liar is somebody who speaks wrongly about God, blasphemes, has wrong doctrine about him, uh, pr represents him in the wrong way. And a murderer is someone who persecutes and hates and goes about to uh, hurt and kill and destroy God's people. Liar and a murderer. And you will find, probably without exception, that every single opposition throughout the entire scripture it, it can fit into that category. Liar and a murderer. The, what did Christ, what did Christ um, confront when he talked to the religious rulers of his day. Were, were they that sort of uh, character? What did he call them? Right, so how were they like the serpent? They were lies and murderers. They told untruths about him, they blasphemed God, and they were trying to put him to death. You go through all the different um, symbols in Revelation, you know, you've got the dragon, the beast, the false prophet and so forth, and Babylon, and they're all liars and murderers. It's exactly the same. Now, we want to look at, just, in, just to begin this whole section about Daniel, put him into context, where this all begins. If I ask you the question, where's the first occurrence of the, of the idea of the word enemy in the Bible? Where would you find that? No. <laughs> it's... A, yeah, it's enmity, that's true. That's true. I mean, there's the fight there going on. But where is it an enemy identified? Have, have I ever done the studies on Lot here before? It's 14, yes, exactly. So 
we won't go to Genesis 14, we'll go back a little bit further, back to when all this began. Because you, you are right, brother, and the brother down here at the front is also correct. It is the serpent was the first enemy. But the first occurrence of the word enemy is actually Genesis 14. But you get this idea, you've got the serpent and you've got the woman there. And then those two federal heads sort of branch out into different systems, obviously. And they ultimately form Babylon. Now, who's the, who's the first king of Babylon? It's Nimrod. Was he a good guy? No, he wasn't. He was a mighty hunter before God. And when it says he's mighty hunted before Yahweh, it doesn't mean he went out with a bow and arrow and shot great big heifers and brought them back to feed people. That would just say he's a mighty hunter. He's a mighty hunter before God because he opposed God's people and he hunted and persecuted them. That's what it means. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And look what he designed to do in the chapter 11 of Genesis. When he starts Babel and it says... They found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. They said to one another, come and let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, bitumen for mortar. So they had a nice big furnace there at Babel at the beginning. Come let us build, let us build, right? There's this unity, this great big communal and community work going on. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Now, you think about, like, if anybody has ever read about culture before and keeping people together, you've got to have a name. You've got to be part of the, we've talked about this recently, part of the tribe, part of the group. You've got to wear the same things, talk the same language. You've got to have an identification, a title and a name. And the reason why he wanted to do this, because lest we be dispersed, over the whole earth and God saw that they were getting along and it was working because when he looked down he says look behold they are one people and they've got one language so what did God do to them what did God do what did the what did the God of the Jews do to the beginning of the kingdom of Babylon he dispersed them and you know later they repaid the favour to him. That's exactly what Babylon did to Israel. And they hate God. They hate him. This is why it was set up in the beginning. It's all against God and his people and his ways and his, his commands. They were liars and murderers from the beginning. And they wanted unity to be together, to stay together. We're better together. And it's true. Are we not better together? Is it better when we have virtual ecclesias and we stay home and log into the ecclesial um, exhortation? Is that better? Or is it better to come face to face with people that we rub shoulders with and it's a little bit difficult from time to time and we have interpersonal problems, but we still get along and we negotiate the road towards the kingdom together? Is that better or not? Yes, of course it's better. So just because Babylon doesn't mean we do the opposite. It just means when they do it, They're trying to do the exact opposite to ours in serving God. And it comes down then, so we we leave off Babylon where it was set up with Nimrod, and we get down to, right down to the days of Abraham, when Lot was in Sodom, obviously, and Babylon was over there. It says, in the days of Amraphel, Genesis 14, king of Shinar, Arioch, and Kade Laoma and Tidal, king of Goyim, they all come as a confederacy across to the land of Israel, where in the land of Israel, this was a vassal um, conglomerate of kingdoms. And they were paying tribute to Amraphel, king of Shinar, which is king of Babylon. And the other guys that are over there, uh, what was it? Arioch, Kade Laoma and Tidal. Now, for 13 years, they paid the tribute. And in the 13th year, they rebelled and they said, we're not paying no more. And so Babylon, because they want to be unified and they want to uh, have complete domination, they never, ever, ever let go, in they come. Now, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, it's highly likely is a direct descendant of Nimrod, a direct descendant. And over they come to the land of Israel and they wipe out all the kings that try to oppose them. 
and then of course mixed up with that is Lot and so forth and Abraham goes out on Lot's behalf, conquers them, brings Lot back and they go up to Jerusalem and Melchizedek comes out and what does Melchizedek do? What does he say? Look at this. Here it is. Melchizedek comes out and says, because he's the priest of the Most High God in verse 19, he says, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. There's the first occurrence of the word enemy. And it's in relation to Babylon. If you need to mark it down, write it down. Babylon is the enemy. It's an excellent representation. It's a metaphor for sin and death. and Everything that opposes God, it's right there. He's delivered it into your hands. And what does Abraham do at this very time? Yes. What verse is that in? I was looking, I couldn't see it. There it is. He brings out, he brings out food and wine. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? It's fellowship, it's communion, there's oneness about it. You've got many, I mean, we know the symbol of the wine, many grapes brought together. There's a symbol of unity. Wine is a classic symbol of unity. People gather around, they, they sit enjoy wine together they have community isn't it interesting brothers and sisters isn't it interesting that the very next time we're, we're going to consider now what's the very first thing Nebuchadnezzar does when he gets domination once more over that system over that kingdom which dispersed his ancient kingdom what does he do in Daniel chapter 1 He takes them captive. Yes! He brings out food and wine and says, Here, have it. Be a part of us. You're in fellowship with us now. This is significant. And once again, true to form, just like the old kingdom of Babylon, they want to unify. And this is what we're going to look at in Daniel chapter 1. This is the issue. We want to outlive Babylon. Daniel wanted to outlive Babylon. Daniel did outlive Babylon. The, 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 uh, the message for us, the exhortation for us is this is how to outlive Babylon. The key is don't drink the wine of Babylon. They want to unite you. They want you to be part of them. They want you to dance to their tune, march to their drums. They want you to do and say and speak exactly like them. And therefore, isn't it also interesting... We come to our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the first thing he does? He turns the water into wine. As a kid, I used to think, why did he do that? It seems such, like, such a, an, an insignificant, a, a weird, a, such a left-fielded miracle. But it's full of significance. Because that's what Christ is offering us. He's saying, you've got to drink this wine have communion with me, be part of me. I want unity, not with that system. And that's how it's set up, and this is what we want to have a look at this morning. So we're going to go back to Daniel chapter 1 right now and have a think about this. Have a think about these issues. The enemy, the liars and the murderers, and how this system is a beautiful, not a beautiful, but it's a significant and a very visual representation of what sin is and sin is like. Now, let's just, let's just read this little section here together, okay? So, uh, we'll get to verse 1, 2 in a second. So, we want to just make this one point. So Daniel is about trying to remain faithful in a settled condition in an alien culture, okay? This is what it's really about. So there's some problems with Babylon because as a brother over here said, he took them captive, brought them into Babylon and it was forced, it was forced upon them. Now, 
I wanted to I want you to tell me this. I want you to give me some live commentary. You're Jews, you you believe that you have the promises made to Abraham. You are looking at the rising power of Babylon. It's getting larger. They're threatening you. You've heard of the prophets and they've said that you've been sinful and that you're probably going to go across them. You don't believe them. You don't believe that. You're fully in denial and you know that anybody that comes and touches the apple of God's eye will surely be annihilated. So we're going to read this little section here, verses 1 and 2. And what I want you to do, I want you to tell me when I stop, I want you to interject with what you think will happen. So Babylon hasn't invaded yet, but it's just about to. It's coming up to the borders of the land. And you are the Israelites living at that time. And you're the ones who are the sinners. But you're so self-righteous and full of yourselves. I'll put myself in. We're all self-righteous and full of ourselves. And we know that there's no way Babylon can come into here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, I'm one of your little children. What are you going to... Mom, Dad, what's going to happen? Mom, Dad, tell me what will happen. Wake up. Bad men outside. They've got sharp swords. Help. <sighs> yes, yes, that's a good story, Mum. That's a good story, Dad. Is that what's going to happen this time? Probably. <laughs> I, I want to know because I'm really scared. What's going to happen? How? <laughs> There's so many of them. You get the idea. Now, but you have to be more confident than that. You say, well, we're going to put the deck chairs up on the walls and we're going to watch the lightning show. It's going to be fantastic when God opens up the earth and just annihilates all the, Assyri all the Assyrians, all the Babylonians like the Assyrians. That's what's going to happen. You remember, son, you remember the story in Leviticus 10? If anyone even comes near God's house, he'll be annihilated with fire from the most holy place. I mean, you can't survive that. There's no way. God has promised us uninterrupted succession all the way from Abraham right through the times of our kings all the way to Messiah. We don't know how long that is, but it's going to be soon. No, we're not going to be taken and Nebuchadnezzar he besieges it and he, he blasts through the walls, takes them captive and he takes some of the vessels out of the house of God and God sits idle and does nothing. What a massive culture shock that is. Massive. We talked about it just yesterday in the exhortation when the Lord had been crucified. Cleopas and his wife were probably walking out of the truth. Peter was probably wondering whether or not life's worth going on. All the disciples didn't know what to do. What a pointless existence. This is how the Jews must have felt at this time. And so the problems with living in Babylon, if I can go. They had to do normal, faithful things because they were exiles. This is not a chosen immigration program. They had to settle in an alien land with a language they didn't understand. They didn't understand a language. And you imagine the script being different. Like I've been, I've, I've been um, on travelling sometimes, like to Dubai or something, and you see the Arabic script and it's really disconcerting. And you hear people speak to you with a really different language to English. And their gruff and their voice and the way they pronounce their words is brash. And it sounds like they're yelling at you. And if you don't do what they say... They're probably going to hurt you, inflict some pain. And all it is in their language is, would you mind just moving across here, please? But you, but it's, it, you, you don't know, and it's frightening. 
We had a young kid, is a Korean young boy, who immigrated to Australia, and we had to teach him. He couldn't speak English for the first two years. He'd say, uh, Jimmy, do you, what are you doing? Is yes, sir. Jimmy, are you meant to be in class? What are you out here for? Yes, sir. And so you just just walk away and leave, leave him. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> when there's communication breakdown, there's no unity. And it must have been very hard for the Jews, massively hard. They were dislocated. They were surrounded by a, a pagan religion. There was no place that you could go to. Nebuchadnezzar was going to build them a nice little hall where they could have Sunday school so you could all get together again. That would take years for that to happen. It happened in people's houses. How hard would it be to maintain your faith without an object, an artefact like a hall, a temple, where you could go to and practice your religion? It would be very, very difficult. They had to remain faithful. And they didn't have their, you know, they didn't have their, their uh, writings, they didn't have their, their Jewish books, they didn't have their temple, they didn't have any sacrificial worship. It was very, very difficult. And when Babylon came across, whole families didn't get to go across to Babylon intact. Women were treated by the Babylonians like women are always treated in war. And the men were mutilated. Many of them were made eunuchs. Daniel was made a eunuch. It was a terrible, terrible time. And we think, oh, well, that was ancient Babylon. It's okay now. We, we live in a tolerant society. And they accept everything. Well, they don't. They don't accept everything. They accept everything but us. They accept everything but God. They accept everything but any difference of opinion. The slightest sign that you don't show total approval of all that they stand for, you'll see the hatred come through. So it must have been very, very difficult for the Jews as they came across to Babylon. Now, so you, you go through this culture shock and you think, what is life worth living for? God's obviously given us up because I told my son and I told my daughter that the Babylonians had never come in here. Just like the days of Hezekiah, he'd destroy them. And just like the days of Nadab and Abihu, God would take care of those who ever touched the sanctity of his holy things. And none of that even happened. We couldn't foretell it. My, wor my worldview has been completely shattered. I didn't expect it to go like this. I didn't foresee it, but it's happened. Everything that I'd lived for, everything I gave my life and my family to is now gone. What is the point of serving God? And Babylon now wants to put them through this um, uh, enculturation process whereby they give up all their Jewishness and they become all of Babylonian. That's what it's about. Don't bother. What's the point? You're not going to get your fig trees to settle under. There's not going to be a kingdom. This is the kingdom now on earth, here in Babylon. You've got to re you're Daniel now. You've got to reach for something, an anchor, something to calibrate your existence in Babylon, something to give you hope and some meaning to remain faithful. What's it going to be? And you think about our day and where we live now. We live in the last days. But man, they're going for a long time, aren't they? I mean, 88 went, well, you, some of you were around 67, I certainly wasn't. But I was around in 87, 88. There were brothers and sisters in Lismore that had their bags packed ready to go one Sunday afternoon. Because back then we were pretty naive and there were some pretty immature brothers and sisters. But I mean, they're well-meaning. But they put a date on the calendar and said Christ is going to return on this day. About 40 years after Israel were uh, uh, announced as a nation, had their bags packed and they were ready to go. 88. Well, we might be a few years out. 98, 97, 98 goes by. 50 years, and that was significant for us all. So we changed our dates, didn't we? We said, oh, well, maybe 48's not the date we should you know, date things from. Let's take it from 67. And we keep doing that. But we're still wrong. And I'm even miffed about it. I think, well, how much longer is it going to be? My kids have grown up saying, Dad, he's taking a long time. And I say, well, kids, he is. And now, like Daniel, we are in another 
alien culture. And we're not just here for a short time. All collectively, <gasps> holding our breath, thinking Jesus is going to come back and we won't have to get our insurance or our superannuation or worry about our education or anything like that. No, it's not true. He may be some time off, but he's certainly longer than what any of us expected. And it's worrying. And so we've got to be like Daniel, living in, this, living in a settled condition in an alien culture. How are we going to do it? Now, Daniel, Daniel was reaching for some meaning in this in this you know this terrible terrible um situation and he's there you got the king nebuchadnezzar and sometimes do you guys ever feel sorry for nebuchadnezzar you know he tried hard he blew up and then god brought him down and he blows up again in pride and god brings him back down and then he pops back out of the box and says no it's got to be my way and god says get back in your box and it happens and we sort of feel sorry for him but you've got to understand Nebuchadnezzar was deeply religious. There's no doubt at all that, like, we understand Australian history. I, I know about Captain Cook and when we became a nation. You know about 4th of July and the history here in America. There's no doubt he understood the Babylonian history. He knew about Cato Laema. He knew about Nimrod and Amraphel. And he knew about Abraham, probably the great traitor, because that was significant when it came to the time of the battle. It was Abraham, the Jew. And he met with Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And, they, and, and uh, Babylon, or uh, Nebuchadnezzar, deeply religious, wanting to proselyze and create unity in his new kingdom. As it says there, you, you read some historical um, records. His god was probably Marduk. His dad's god was um, Nabu, from which he was named after. And there's an inscription where he does style himself as Nabu's beloved and favourite. So he thought he was working for the Babylonian gods. There's absolutely no doubt about that. He ran their fan club. He did everything he could to put down every other religion, particularly the Jewish one. Now that's very significant. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. And you're Daniel and you're trying to reach for a bit of meaning. A little bit of meaning in all of this. Is there anybody else that Daniel could have seen some likeness to his situation that had gone before in Israel's history? Who would that be? Yeah, it's Joseph. We all know it. Who's, who's got the, uh, the... Oh, you want to see that, do you? I was going to show the kids... <laughs> Starship Babylon, right? They're the aliens. They come to Earth. They've whizzed them away. They want to make them aliens. I wasn't going to show it to you because you wouldn't appreciate it, but apparently you do. <laughs> Daniel and Joseph. Everybody has the insert in their Bible, don't they? It's good. It's good. But Daniel would re reach back in his mind and he thinks, I'm, I'm just like, what, where, I'm an exile. He was an exile. We we're both young, going across. It's terrible what happened. He, Daniel knows he's not one of the sinners. He's not self-righteous. He's not like that. But he does love God and he is young and he is following God. He knows it's not his fault. No matter what contribution he may have made in the big scheme of things to them being carried across to Babylon, he knows, like Joseph, he's a godly man and he's trying his best. Both were publicly humiliated by false accusation. Both were vindicated. Both were renowned for interpreting dreams. We'll find this out in chapter 2. Both elevated to uh, 2 IC in the kingdom. And that happened around in the second or third year of them being there in that exiled condition. And both were recognised as possessing gifts from God as wise men and they became saviours of their people. So Daniel's starting to learn now about hidden himself in Babylon and he's reaching for something to hold on to to give him a little bit of encouragement to continue faithfully and although he doesn't know it he's going to see soon that he'll be able to calibrate his life in an exiled place of Babylon on the basis of Joseph and it's funny you know we put those uh, inserts in our Bible and we tick the box and we go oh isn't that wonderful did you get that point oh no I missed that point I put that one in Good, do that, but 
what do we learn? We learn by listening to, learning about Daniel, we learn about Joseph. By learning about Joseph, we learn about Daniel. And by learning about both of them, who do we learn most about? That's right, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're here for. They're models of what he went through. And in understanding those, we can apply it to ourselves. This is what's good about this book. And people go, oh, it's just all the old stuff. It's not. It's good. Like I do To Kill a Mockingbird for, um, for English, and some of the old teachers have taught it, you know, for many years. They go, oh, To Kill a Mockingbird is so old. Oh. But for the kids, they've never even heard of it. And it's new to them. And they find it really, really interesting, Harper Lee's book. And when you teach this, you might think, oh, I've heard all this before. But don't, don't forget it because your grandkids and your children need to hear it. It's very, very important. Daniel needed to understand it too and he was starting to form an understanding of his experience in Babylon as it related to Joseph's experience in Egypt. It was very, very, very important. Now, we go to Daniel chapter 1 again. What time is it? What time am I meant to finish? 15 minutes. Are you going to give Brother Neville any longer? <laughs> because I'll, I'll be watching. I've got my spies in here when I'm over at the uh, teenagers. All right, we're going to make some ground up now. So, Daniel... They, they come in, some of the uh, nobility and the elite of Israel, and Daniel's one of them, are separated because they're going to be trained specifically. They want the brains. Nebuchadnezzar, he's a smart, smart administrator, and he wants to make sure his kingdom continues. So he's going to get the smartest. Those that have knowledge and understanding can be taught and make them Babylonians, and he's going to make them work for him, serve in an official capacity in the court. And that's why they've been separated. Now, Look, look what happens. So this is what happens. Babylon, in this enculturation process, wants to do this. Made them eunuchs, took them from other captives, separated them, taught them for three years, educated them, allocated a daily portion of the food, of the wine of the king, trained them how to conduct themselves, and he renamed them after the gods of Babylon. Now, you're Daniel for a second, and you want to make a stand, and you want to remain Jewish. Of all the things there that you could object to, which is the one you'd object to? No. Yeah, I'd go with the one at the top as well. That's exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, the name. I mean, they're going to bestow upon us a Babylonian God. But I'm a Jewish person. I'm not going to accept that. But then again, that wouldn't change who you are as a character. It's just a, it's just a title. It's nothing the name but I tell you what you don't have to go far into the New Testament like Mark chapter 7 to make a good case for objecting to the education because like Christ says it's not the food that goes into you that defiles you that just just leaves you it's what goes into your mind and settles in your heart if you and I were Daniel we would have probably said no we refuse to be educated by the Babylonians. We don't want to think that way. We don't want to have our characters changed because of the new knowledge that you're going to give us. So why does Daniel say no to the wine? Out of all the things, why does he say no to the wine? That's what I find absolutely amazing. And it's not, brothers and sisters, just because it was offered to the gods. The clothes he wore, the chairs he sat on, the whole of Babylon was offered to the gods. He couldn't touch anything that wasn't dedicated to some Babylonian god. That wasn't the reason. That wasn't the reason at all. And it wasn't just because it was, you know, come to the king, it was bread and wine, because later in chapter 10, when it comes to the, um, the Persian kingdom, Daniel drinks wine and he eats bread. So it's not the, the stuff the actual literal food, that's the problem. There's a significance here attached to it. There's a symbolism attached to it, which we've already alluded to, which Babylon was mandating. You've got to drink. You've got to eat. You've got to become like one of us. And we should be able to understand it 
I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? Here's a good one. So, do you ever have special morning teas for certain things? I mean, you have morning tea at work, don't you? Does everybody have tea and biscuits at work? Yep, okay. Is there anything wrong with eating tea and biscuits? No. Some might prefer coffee, same diff. You get the idea. So, sometimes in Australia, we have special morning teas for, say, men's health or breast cancer. Is there anything wrong with supporting men's health or giving a donation to breast cancer and having a morning tea for that? Sit around and go, anything wrong with that? Of course it's not. Not at all. Even though it has that special um, uh, symbolism attached to it, it doesn't matter. But in the places I've worked at, not the school I'm thankfully mercifully at now, We've had morning teas for the LGBT movement. Now, as we said, nothing wrong with tea and biscuits, is there? But now there's this special significance attached to it. Is it okay for me to go up there and give a donation, sit there with all the rest of the teachers and say, yes, we're here as unified, all one together, supporting this. Is that okay? Why not? What's wrong with those poor people? They can't help it. What, are we being judgmental? We don't get to choose the rules. This is the thing. Like Sam said this morning, it doesn't matter. God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Even if we think, but they're in a committed relationship, which is what we get fed all the time. Their significance matters. And at this time, Daniel knew this is what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do. You're going to be like us. You're going to be a Babylonian. And I want you to have communion with us. It's not just about the Babylonian gods. It's about everything that opposes God was represented there in the king's food and the king's wine. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. Right before, would you believe, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, which is all about the cup of Christ. I mean, another example. Has anybody here got any friends that are from another religion who have... Has anybody here ever had another a group of people come over to their house and have a meal with them before? I mean, I have. We've had Pentecostals come over. We've had discussions. We've shared food, had a glass of wine maybe. Is there a problem with that? Of course not. But would I go and have food and have a glass of wine with them at their church? You, sound doubt you seem doubtful. Of course, you wouldn't be seen dead there. Because that's saying a whole different set of things. There's significance attached to it. 1 Corinthians 10, look at this. This is what it's about. Babylon knew it, you know it, I know it, Abraham knew it, and Daniel certainly knew it. Verse uh, 1. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptised into Moses in the cloud, and all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. Now, if we all went to this meeting and afterwards we all went out to play a game of soccer and then we all went and had a meal together what am i trying to suggest by all of us doing that there's fellowship and there's total unity isn't there unity that's what it's about unity everybody doing the same thing all right I think time goes quicker on this side of the hemisphere. Very quickly, verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Ooh, worshipping other gods. It's always man. It's always yourself. There's no other gods except the real God and then you. You'll make different manifestations of it, like large rocks, nice cars, big boats, things like that. But it's all a projection of yourself in the end. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Of course, what's the AV say? Communion? Same diff. Koinonia. Communion. Participation. It together in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a koinonia, communion, participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, there is one body, we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. 
They ate the sacrifices. They were participants. There was communion. There was fellowship in the altar. And then he goes on to talk about anything offered to idols. Is an idol anything? No, we know that. There's no such thing as idols. Paul says that. But we're not going to have anything to do with demons. Not, we don't want to have that. We're not going to participate with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord. And let's put this in here. The cup of Nebuchadnezzar. The cup of Babylon. You can't partake of the table of the Lord. And so what does Babylon always do? This is why Daniel refused the wine. Because he understood he didn't want to unite with the common values of Babylon. They were transgressing the commands, the plan, the purpose, the character and all the values of God. And he understood that it was spiritual food. It spoke of who you were going to serve and who you were going to worship. And in the context, Daniel knew that they wanted to make him one with them. And it's interesting, isn't it? When you go to chapter 11 of Corinthians, there's the cup of Christ. And what was Paul's problem with the way they had the, the uh, supper of the Lord in Corinthians? Uh, yeah, but what was the big problem? It was all about unity and in Corinth, yes, there was divisions. There's divisions amongst you. That's not how the cup of Christ works. And Nebuchadnezzar's cup didn't work, sorry, worked exactly the same. Nebuchadnezzar wanted everybody to drink from his cup because he wanted to get rid of the, the divisions of Babel, the divisions that that God, the God of the Jews, put upon us and he wanted to create unity. And this is incredible. Daniel saw it. So we open our eyes. We see it in our daily life. We know, we should know, we've got to have an awareness, a spiritual acute and keenness about ourselves so that we can understand what is something we should stand for and what isn't. What does have a spiritual attachment to it, which we stand aside. We don't have to make a big song and dance about it, but we quietly say no. If I was forced to have to go to an LGBT uh, morning tea at school, I would have called in sick that day. I wouldn't have been there at all. Thankfully, when there's an option, I just happen to be busy in my classroom at my old school. Oh, you didn't go. No, I didn't go. You don't have to make a huge objection, walk around with a placard. You know, they're all drinking tea and coffee, come in, we hate, you know, da da da. That's not the way we're meant to act. It's not Christ-like. And Christ's first miracle proved that this is what his life was about. I'm going to share this with you. You're going to have communion with me, that we may become one together and one with our Heavenly Father. That's what the wine's about. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine for the same reason. And Babylon has never, ever changed. So what happens when you get to Revelation? What does Babylon do? And what does God say? I've got a problem with you for doing because you forced all nations, you mandated, didn't suggest it, didn't offer it. You said, it's a rule. You've got to drink from our cup. You made all nations drink. Persecution, wrong doctrine, immorality, everything that's a contrast to Christ. Of course, we know it's Rome in the New Testament, but don't just think it's confined to the Catholic Church and, and the European civilization. They're analogous and metaphorical for sin, as we said already. You look at that system, you go, oh, that's what sin looks like. It's terrible. It's against God. It's against his people. And I don't want to have part of that. I want to keep away from that. And of course, drinking Babylon's wine can affect us every single day individually. Sin challenges us every single day. Drink its wine. Do this. Every time you do something that you know is to be wrong, you're drinking the wine of Babylon. Simple as that. It's not even a difficult uh, symbol to work out. Don't think it is, brothers and sisters. It's relevant to us now. Every time I get angry with my wife and I act unjustly towards her, I drink Babylon's wine. Even if I'm, even if I'm justified. Can't act like that. No, not ever would. I'm a, I'm a good husband. I always buy flowers all the time. An individual or group that seeks to lead you from God, taking somebody away from God, killing them, murder, lying about 
Yeah, it's okay to do. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. God doesn't care about that. Drinking Babylon's wine. A nation or a government, as we've looked at already, politically manifested. It's Babylon, it's Rome. It's America, it's Australia. Any government set up that's not based upon the principles of God that forces you to partake of its way of life and does not allow you to serve your God is trying to do what Nebuchadnezzar did, make you drink the wine of Babylon. That's what it's about. And I believe, and it, that's exactly why Daniel refused it. That's why he refused the wine. He didn't object to being separated from the other captives. Oh, let me be with my friends. <laughs> he didn't ex object to the subjected education program of Babylon. That didn't happen. And he didn't object to being made a eunuch, or may have, but it happened. And he didn't make a, you know, something strong objection about that. And he didn't even object to standing before Nebuchadnezzar at the end. But what we do find is when he goes there and he asks, now, we've got one minute or is it gone already? No means it's gone. Okay, so in summary, <laughs> I will have you just turn back to Daniel chapter 1. The three, and a half year, three years has gone by. Nebuchadnezzar now questions them to work out which one's the smartest. And he goes, I have Daniel, I have Hannah and I have, have Mishael and I have, who's the other one? That one. Have them too. Have them also. And then we get this throwaway verse. And Daniel was there 21 until the first year of King Cyrus. And that is everything. Because Daniel has outlived Babylon. And brothers and sisters, the exhortation for us is simply this. You and I want to be like Daniel, and I want to live out Babylon, and so do you and your families. And the exhortation from chapter 1 is, you tell me, how do we outlive Babylon? Okay, negatively, we don't drink the wine of Babylon or partake of sin. But put it in a positive way, what do we do? We Take the cup of Christ, which is by doing righteousness, living faithfully in a settled alien uh, country, in this place, in this condition, doing the best we can.